Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Good evening, friends, and welcome to Crime and Punishment, a legal podcast, the official podcast of the Invictus Law Firm, PA, a criminal defense law firm in Orlando, Florida, the website for which is AugustusInvictus.com, and that is me, yours truly, the host of this program. I see Cozy Frog out there. How you doing, buddy? And Cosmos, hey now. So, we'll see if there's uh, if the sound is working, but really I'm going to just uh, jump into things. Listen, usually I'm very methodical. I have plotted out all of the articles. I've got everything ready to discuss. I know the issues tonight. Um, nope, not going to happen leaving for Virginia in the morning, and uh, I just got too much to do. I haven't done this program in a month. Uh, though, in my defense, last week, last week I did Radical Agenda with Chris Cantwell. Um, let me pull that up. I've got that link somewhere. You know what? That's in the Telegram. First thing we should probably do is link you all to this Telegram. What I wanted to do tonight, copy, and I'm going to paste it right here in YouTube. All right. So please do join the Telegram. I'm also going to tell you my Twitter is fire. It's at Emperor Invictus. Um, got some pictures of Muhammad on there. He is white, of course, uh, for maximum offensive uh, impact. But I'm giving you these because my I had a conversation with my business coach. And every time, every single time I talk to my business coach, whether it's individually or it's in the mastermind group, every single time he pulls up my Twitter <laughs> and he goes through post by post explaining how this has nothing to do with my business. <laughs> And it's all crazy posting. And it's not going to make you any money, Augustus. I don't know what you're doing. You're too smart to be this stupid. <laughs> uh, every single time. So last time was, what, Friday? It's Monday now. So we're going to go through my Twitter feed. And uh, we're going to compare that to my Telegram account. Telegram is what we call on mission. Uh, because everything there pertains to what we do here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's legal. It's uh, about things that we talk about. It's about some of my own cases. Um, so let's go back to October 21st. I'm going to post this link in the YouTube. And this is to Radical Agenda. So there you go, everybody. You should definitely watch that. We're up, we must be up to 10,000 views or so by now. Um, it's a long interview. I think it was about two hours with Chris Cantwell. Uh, we discussed everything in the Charlottesville case. Um, Cantwell was, of course, there at Charlottesville. Cantwell was the one who recommended that we call the police because... Obviously, Antifa are going to disrupt it if they know about what we're doing, um, which they did find out, and they did disrupt it, and six years later, uh, we are the ones being charged with a crime, it's pure insanity. So some of the things we talked about, the involvement of the chief judge of the circuit over there, and his family, his wife and daughter specifically, in the events in question. Never recused himself from the case. Never breathed a word about his or his family's connection to the Torchlit rally on August 11th. Or the, the events of Unite the Right in general. Which is egregious. Egregious. Um, as another lawyer pointed out, you know, judges are quick to disclose, well, my, uh, you know, second cousin twice removed, well, his uh, son's, uh, you know, wife... Um, has a sister who was at this wedding of someone uh, involved in this case. And I just want you guys to know that if you think I should recuse myself. Like, judges will overshare 
details. They will over disclose so that no one would ever question their impartiality in the case. And in this case, this judge accepted guilty pleas. He accepted guilty pleas. He denied men bond. Never breathed the word about it until he was called out on it. So we discussed that. We discussed the involvement of the prosecutor, uh, who was an Antifa organizer at the very events in question. Unprecedented in American history, to my knowledge. And the example I always give is, imagine that Martin Luther King is walking through Birmingham, Alabama, and he's got all those people, they're all marching through the streets, and they're being demonstrated against by the Ku Klux Klan. Well, King and all his people, they go home. Ku Klux Klan then begins to take over the prosecutor's office, and six years later, the Ku Klux Klan drags Martin Luther King and all of his people back to Birmingham, Alabama to prosecute them for a crime that the prosecutors at the time did not believe was a crime. It was First Amendment protected speech. No one in America would think that that is just or that that is due process or that that is anything other than pure Bolshevism, and yet that is exactly what has happened in Charlottesville. The Antifa literally became the prosecution. They took over the prosecutor's office. And here we are, six years later. So we talked a lot about that. Um, the acknowledgement in the Hefe report that both the chief judge and the prosecutor were present during the events now being prosecuted. Again, unbelievable. The explicit cooperation of the Antifa and the prosecutor's office, we discussed that. I mean, just, they're not even hiding it. I mean, they're talking about it quite explicitly. Um, the hostile takeover of the prosecutor's office by the Antifa, as I said. The media campaign by the chief judge's wife to force the Commonwealth's attorney to prosecute these torch-wielding neo-Nazi terrorists who held her and the chief judge hostage. What an amazing claim. And again, he never disclosed this to anybody. And you've got to wonder, just be amazed at the arrogance. The prosecutor's office and the judiciary in Charlottesville, not just working with Antifa, but being Antifa. So we talked about all that on Cantwell's show. Link is there in the YouTube. Um, I was going to do it here, but Cantwell's a good friend. I've known him for a long, long time. And uh, as you may know, I, you may not know because I couldn't talk about it. There was a gag order, and I really didn't even feel comfortable saying there's a gag order. I think I might have mentioned it once or twice, but, uh, you know, I just didn't say anything. You know, from the time they let me out of jail on uh, July 25th, I think, um, until last week's program with Cantwell, uh, I was under a gag order. Could not say a word about the case. It was incredible. An incredible violation of the First Amendment. On top of the fact that we're all being dragged to Charlottesville, you know, states away, to be prosecuted for an imaginary crime that is obviously a persecution of free speech. So, I mean, charitably, maybe it was a mistake, and not even the judge's mistake, maybe... Maybe it was someone on her staff that made this clerical error because it was supposed to be um, Invictus is not allowed to talk about the alleged victims in the case or try to contact them, which obviously, I mean, if we knew who those alleged victims even were, uh, I have zero reason to contact them. Um, uh, but that is not what it came out to be on paper came out to be Invictus is not allowed to say a word about this case at all. No public comments whatsoever. And that is clearly illegal. The judge, you know, was quick to say that is not what I meant. And uh, she lifted it. So just you should probably go watch that. So right after that, I posted something. Um, again, this is Telegram here. A Reuters article about Trump's federal election subversion trial. 
and asking, should it be on TV? You might have seen that uh, his Colorado trial was on TV today, at least the evidentiary hearing. I didn't get to watch it, unfortunately. I have, like, actual work to do. <laughs> it's terrible. So, the Colorado trial is about whether Trump should be allowed to be on the Colorado ballot for the presidential election. A friend of mine months ago sent me some fringe article about, well, insurrection this and that and, uh, you know, participation in rebellion and this is actually outlawed because of the Civil War. And I was like, well, that would be amazing if they actually brought this <laughs> anywhere. Um because it would show just how corrupt this entire system is. I mean, it would be incredible if they pulled this off. And look at that! Months and months later, my friend turns out to be a prophet, and uh, here we are. They're actually doing it. So, I again, I didn't get to watch it. I uh, had things to do today. I don't know how it turned out. Uh, I don't know if they're going forward with this or not. I, I don't know. But that was that article. So let's keep going here. What's after that? Oh! Also about Trump. Lawyer who claimed Trump, quote, won in a landslide, pleads guilty in Georgia Rico case. This is about Ellis pleading guilty, and then right after her, another lawyer uh, pled guilty. So, what it looks like is, oh, well, all these lawyers are turning on Trump, and they're saying, oh, he actually didn't win, but it's actually not what they're saying. Now, Sidney Powell also pled guilty, so we're talking three lawyers here. It's not what they're saying. There's like some obscure facts where, I think in Sidney Powell's case, like her team went and like downloaded information from a voting booth or something like that. Like That's what the actual allegation is. Not that she's backtracking on the election was stolen, but there's some technical charge here that she took a plea to and the whole case for her is over. She's out. <sighs> you know, I don't know what to say about that. I defend people all the time on this program and in real life um, who take plea deals. I get it. 100% get it. I've been in there. <laughs> a long time I've been in jail and uh, I've seen men take pleas to things they didn't do because their lives are falling apart you know, they lost their truck they lost their apartment they can't get their kid to school mom is a junkie you know their whole life falls apart no one can take care of their family but them to take a plea so they can get out of there and fix their lives now they're on probation but at least you know they know where their kid is. They get to feed their kid lunch every day. They get to feed their kid breakfast, take them to school. That's why people take pleas. I 100% get that. I do not hold that against anybody. In a case like this, though, these lawyers taking plea deals, man, did you not know that this was going to happen? I think of all the things that have happened to me, but like my, my, my righteous indignation is the fact that not only is none of this true, but I, this is not at all, this just blindsides you. You know, these like domestic allegations or petty crimes or all this nonsense. That, well, I guess I've also been accused of pretty outrageous crimes too like human sacrifice and you know trying to build a neo-nazi army to go into outer space and colonize the galaxy like that's pretty cool but most of the other stuff is like i didn't sign up for that that is not the politics that i thought we were getting into so something like charlottesville it's like okay well obviously i did not commit a crime everybody knows i did not commit a crime you know but it's politics you knew that was going to happen sooner or later. If you didn't, you're retarded. Uh, you cannot be in right-wing activism 
and expect you you know, you just got a nine to five and you know, people are going to leave you alone and respect your right to free speech. That's ridiculous. And I tell right wing activists all the time: you got to be prepared to go to jail, and you got to be prepared to lose, and you got to be prepared to appeal your case and fight it all the way to Supreme Court. And this could take five years of your life for a rally or for posting flyers or stickers or whatever it is, whatever nonsense they're trying to charge you with to suppress your free speech. You got to be in it to win it, man. You got to be in it for years. So these people saying that an election was stolen, a presidential election in the United States of America was straight up stolen. And the man in office is a fraud and the rightful president is being prosecuted by a corrupt regime that has no legitimacy. You think you can say something like that and file lawsuits about it and, and put us on the brink of civil war and they're not going to try to throw you in prison and destroy your family and all the rest and bankrupt you and drag your name through the mud. What did you think was going to happen? That is your job as a public servant. That is your job as a political leader. That is your job as a lawyer involved in this sort of thing. How did you not know this was going to happen? So, you know, I understand dudes in Appalachia taking a plea because they got to take care of their family. I honestly, I. It is hard to understand people like Sidney Powell or Jenna Ellis or I don't know about Rudy Giuliani. I don't think he's taken a plea yet, but could you imagine Giuliani taking a plea? That's unheard of. How did you not know that this was going to happen? Why are you not fighting to the death over this? That's, it's tough to uh, tough to register for me. Anyway, she pled guilty. That's the next article here on Telegram. And then the following article, uh, you'll notice I do this once per day, and I post the same article on Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, Gab, LinkedIn, everything. Um, in my defense, anonymous business coach, although Twitter is a bit wild, I will admit that, just like Instagram, I... I think it's fair to say I don't use Instagram for business at all. It's just 100% personal. Post pictures of my kid, church stuff, you know. Um, next article, Biden administration deliberately floods America with illegal immigrants. Right? Well, I mean, we've seen that happening for years now. That's not, I would, you can't even call that an open secret. It's just, that's how it is. Texas, the state of Texas, I forget what the name of the, it was a really lame name for an operation, but they do this operation to put up razor wire and buoys in the water uh, to stem the flood of illegal immigrants. So what does the Biden administration do in response to this? They send border agents to literally cut the wire and let these people into the country. Amazing. I mean, that alone, and that's not even the point of the article. That's just, that's the background of the article. This happened. So Texas, what is their response? What can you do about this besides secede and wage war on the federal government? Texas is forced to sue in federal court. Not on something you'd think like, well, we Texans have a right to defend our land and these illegal immigrants bringing our cartels and their narcotics and blah, blah, blah. Nothing like that. No public health and safety, no right to defend your borders, nothing like that. No. They sue for theft, or in civil terms, conversion. They sue for theft and trespassing because the federal government is essentially stealing their razor wire when they're cutting it and pulling it away and trespassing when they do it. Trespass the chattels, I believe. I didn't read the lawsuit, but that's what I would assume it is. So that's what the lawsuit is. Absolute insanity. 
So I feel like that's a, that's a legitimate legal article to post, in my defense. Now, <laughs> the next one, okay. All right, I'll admit. I'll admit. This is totally unprofessional and uh, is not helping me get business. So. <laughs> but, all right, it's funny. In my defense, it's hilarious. So CBS in Austin, Texas, had the best screenshot, I think. I, I looked for, for a bunch of these screenshots uh, to see which one had the best headline and picture of this girl. <laughs> but the headline for here is, uh, <laughs> Illinois Comptroller Fires Attorney for Anti-Semitic Comments. Quote, Hitler should have eradicated all of you. End quote. <laughs> so, one thing you won't see in my telegram is... Article after article after video, 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 you know, propaganda piece, pictures of the war going on right now in Israel and Palestine. Don't say a word about it on my professional channel. Twitter is, yes, Twitter is out of control. <laughs> Got that stuff everywhere. Um, but this is obviously a bleeding over from that. So this girl, Sarah Chowdhury whom we can all assume is a raging liberal. She's in Chicago, for God's sake. That's strike one, two right there. Um, president of the South Asian Bar Association of Chicago, you can't be in a position like that and work for the government of Illinois and not be a raging liberal. I mean, I, am, I went to law school in Chicago. I'm persona non grata in Chicago. I, I couldn't get a job there to save my life. Um, so this girl gets in an argument on Instagram and actually says these things. She's fired within 90 minutes. <laughs> so hilarious. I, I uh, posted this with uh, the screenshot with, yo, what's up? Who's got this girl's number? So, all right. Granted, that is not professional. All right. Score from my business coach. Next article is about Planned Parenthood. Again, again, Texas. Texas, in a, in a sense, is leading the way on a lot of these issues. God bless them. God bless Texas. But it's really a commentary on the state of America that this is how you make headway in these areas. Uh, man, there's some off-air comments I would make about the state of things, but... So you just heard about the article where the Biden administration sends border agents to cut the razor wire and allow illegal immigrants to flood Texas, right? So Texas has to stu sue because, oh, they stole our razor wire and they're trespassing on our property, right? Now check this out. So... These people want to make abortion illegal. You can't really do that. I mean, it's 2023 after all. Right? Everybody knows that a woman has the right to murder her child. It's just the way God intended it to be. So, we can't outlaw baby murder. Uh, that would be just unthinkable. So what should Texas do uh, if they don't like baby murder? They should, they should fine them out of existence. Just fine Planned Parenthood until they can't operate them anymore. Operate anymore. Can't, they got to you know, fine them billions of dollars so that they just can't perform abortions anymore. Problem solved. This is exactly what the SPLC did. That's their business model. And the fact that the state of Texas is following the SPLC business model just absolutely rubs me the wrong way. It's a disgusting, subhuman leftist thing to do. It's gross. This is exactly the sort of thing that crashed America. Like, just grow your balls back and outlaw abortion, for God's sake. Kick Planned Parenthood out of there. So they're fining them, right? 
That's the next one. I think that's, you know, it's not Florida law, but it is about a lawsuit and it's legal, so. Okay. All right. All right. All right, anonymous business coach. The next one's pretty bad, too. <laughs> so, uh, you might have seen. Boy, I don't even know how long we've been on here. Um, you might have seen that Mike Johnson won the speaker uh, position in the House of Representatives. <laughs> the guy is anti-LGBT. He is uh, as Christian as it gets. He's a Southerner. He's a Trump guy. He's a constitutional lawyer. I mean, check, check, check. All the best boxes. This guy is it. It just came out of nowhere. Amazing. America might finally be saved after all. And what's the first thing he does? He makes a speech saying, the first thing I'm going to do is help Israel. I'm going to pass a resolution that's going to give Israel whatever they want. Ooh. You can't make this stuff up. Then you got Nikki Haley saying, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, and we need to give Israel everything they want, when they want it, no questions asked. But this guy, Mike Johnson, shame. Because what he's saying is, you know, that there's articles about, well, the leftists don't like that he's, you know, invoking God's name in the, in the house. And uh, he's very open about his religion, and the leftists think that it's superstitious, and we can't base national policy on superstition and irrational beliefs, like, like leftism is a rational belief. In any event, it's just... What a tragedy. You've got this guy checking all these boxes. Could be the best. Could be the greatest. And he uses all that to say, we should help Israel to genocide the Palestinians. You know? We should help them get the Holy Land. And that's the crazy thing about all these Christians supporting this war. On Israel's side, that is. I mean, I get the, the actual Nazis who want to support the Palestinians because it's, you know, wiping out Israel. I understand where they're coming from. That is a, at least a logically consistent position with their overall ideology. But Christians, whether they're Catholic or evangelical like Mike Johnson or whoever else, Christians saying... The Holy Land should be in the hands of the Jews. It's absolute madness. The very people who killed Christ should be put in charge of Jerusalem. <laughs> For 2,000 years, the Christians knew the score on this. And it was battle for the past 1,500 years. Who's going to control the Holy Land, the Muslims or the Christians? The Christians or the greatest Christian heresy, Islam? Which ones are going to be? And now, for the past, what, 80 years? We're like, nope, you know what? You know who should have it? The Jewish people, the chosen people. Now they're chosen. They were chosen. God took that away, and now, for some reason, we've got evangelicals saying, nope, they are definitely chosen, always have been, despite 2,000 years of human history, and, by the way, the New Testament, Mike Johnson is one of these people. I, what do you say about that? Anyway, it has nothing to do with the law firm, so, all right, score, that's two for my business coach. The next one is an excellent article on VDARE. I'm actually tempted to actually read this one. How long have we been on here? I wonder, does YouTube tell me how long I've been streaming? Or do you guys have any idea? Uh, Judeo-Christians. Yes, thank you, Clint. 
that term did not exist until you know the state of Israel was created. Hey, guy whose name sounds like a profanity. What's up, man? Long time no see. Oh, Seamus is here too. Um, thirty-two minutes ago. Oh, we got plenty of time. All right, yeah, plenty of time. So let's read this excellent Vidare article. It kind of goes into some more detail. So I don't think you're going to be um, double dipping if you listen to this article and you watch the Chris Cantwell uh, podcast, the interview that I did. I think they covered different ground. Um, and this writer uh, is not me and is not Cantwell. Um, this is on Vidare by Eugene Gant. This is uh, titled... Black Antifa Chief Judge Claude V. Worrell must recuse himself from Charlottesville Tiki Torch show trials. Mouthy headline, but exactly on point. Exactly on point. On November 1st, that is the day after tomorrow, which is why I have to leave for Virginia in the morning and uh, why we're just winging it tonight and getting this out of the way because God knows what's going to happen when I'm on the road. On November 1st, Wednesday, two days from now, a hearing in the Circuit Court of Albemarle County, Virginia, will let us know whether the state's judicial system, or at least its 16th Judicial District, is hopelessly politically corrupt. At issue, a motion from Unite the Right Tiki Torch protester Jacob Dix, who argues that Chief, uh, excuse me, that Judge Claude V. Worrell Jr., Chief Judge of the Charlottesville Circuit Court, is clearly biased against him and must recuse himself. Dix also argues that all the judges in the circuit must recuse themselves because they supported Worrell for chief justice. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. There are several arguments that all the judges must recuse themselves. That's number one. Number two, Worrell actually has recused himself. Uh, after my lawyer uh, brought up the, the, this thing, uh, when we came to Charlottesville for our motion to dismiss and he was sitting on the bench, my lawyer said, look, uh, with all due respect, judge, um, you cannot hear this. And he started going into some of the reasons why he was disqualified from hearing the, the motion. And to his credit, he recused himself right there and then. No argument. Didn't ask for a motion. Just immediately recused himself. Um, and then later he wrote a letter opinion recusing himself from all the cases as far as, I'm con as, far as I know. <clears throat> so what we're going there for on Wednesday is actually to recuse the rest of the judges. Um, and it's not just because, you know, they, they selected him as the chief judge uh, it's, or supported him for chief justice. No, um, nothing like that. Uh, it's more that he is their boss. He is being called as a witness. His wife is being called as a witness. His daughter is being called as a witness. His wife is working with Molly Conger, for God's sake. His daughter allegedly worked with the prosecutor when he was an Antifa organizer. They are balls deep, the entire family, in the Antifa. They're being called as witnesses in the trial. Which of his subordinate judges could seriously be impartial determining their credibility as witnesses. Now, that's the main argument. The other is, uh, the other judge there in Charlottesville, she shares not only an office with him, but a staff. I can't even, we don't have time for all the reasons that you have to recuse yourself in that situation, but you do. All right, so that's what we're going there for on Wednesday. Uh, belatedly prosecuting Dix, Augustus Invictus, and other Tiki Torch defendants under an absurd legal theory is bad enough. But Rell actually attended an Antifa organizing meeting that planned to disrupt the Unite the Right rally right across the street from the Tiki Torch parade and denounced it to the police. Writing last month about these politically motivated prosec prosecutions, VDare.com contributor Jason Kessler reported that defendant Augustus Invictus' motion to dismiss strongly argued that the statute under which he and his fellow defendants are charged, written specifically to stop Ku Klux Klan cross burnings, clearly didn't apply to uh, political protests. Hence, two prosecutors 
And, and that's not just like two guys in the prosecutor's office. The two previous people who held the position of the prosecutor, the Commonwealth's attorney in this jurisdiction, two prosecutors uh, had refused to charge the Unite the Right protesters under the law, and the legislature did not amend the statute to include carrying stor- torches. So both the prosecutor and Tim Heafy in writing the Heafy report said, look, if you don't want people marching on campus with torches, change the law. Expand the law to include torches or open flames. But this law does not apply to this conduct. This is First Amendment protected speech. That's my commentary. That's not in the article there. Um, and the legislature did not amend the statute to include carrying torches. In fact, again, this is my commentary. This is not in the article. In fact, they did try to change the law in 2019. They tried to add torches and open flames. And the legislature said, no, we're not doing that. Is, could there possibly be stronger evidence that this law does not apply to that Tiki Torch rally? And yet, that motion was dismissed by a clearly biased judge who is a subordinate to Chief Judge Worrell. Back to the article. <clears throat> but a third prosecutor charged protesters anyway, six years after the march. Unfortunately, on October 11th, Judge Cheryl Higgins rejected Invictus's motion, although he is still able to bring up the First Amendment issue at trial. Right, the First Amendment issue being, obviously, this is a violation of uh, you know, our freedom of speech. Uh, Dix's recusal motion might be even more important. It argues that Worrell's actions the night of the protest, August 11, 2017, along with the public activities and social media posts of his anti-white communist wife and daughter, are irrefutable evidence of bias. As far as Worrell's actions that night, here's a little Latin legalese. Res ipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. No one could possibly read Dix's motion, as I have, that's Eugene here, not me, and conclude any differently. Worrell is a tainted partisan party. Worrell has handled the cases of several Unite the Right defendants. He made rulings adverse to those co-defendants that may have been influenced by his personal experience on August 11th, the motion argues. Worrell could preside over future hearings for Dix and in a bench trial. He, quote, could therefore be the ultimate fact finder at the guilt slash innocence phase of the defendant's case, end quote. Judge Worrell will never, can never, Provide a fair trial in this case, the motion argues. The reason? Here's a long quote here. Judge Worrell not only witnessed the events in question on the night of August 11th, he was an active participant in them. He and his family attended the activist or organized interfaith meeting at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. When the torchlit demonstration began, Judge Worrell saw and heard the event from directly across the street. He felt personally threatened by the demonstration to such an extent that he personally called Charlottesville police officers demanding immediate protection from defendant and his fellow demonstrators. Here's a kicker. This is not in the article, but something I happen to know. He didn't call 911. The judge personally called one of the lieutenants at Charlottesville Police Department. Had him in his personal phone, in his phone number. To call him about this. Back to the article. He and or his family members may have even seen or interacted with the Findan that night. That's dicks, not me. Uh, Few people on earth have been more detailed, uh, excuse me, few people on earth have more detailed personal knowledge of this case than Judge Worrell. He may be called as a witness by one or both parties in this case. End quote. Thus, the motion argues, Worrell will be severely prejudiced against Dix. Beyond that, the judge and his wife and daughter have all manifested a personal bias against Dix and other defendants. That's because the communists who organized the church meeting did so to disrupt the Unite the Right protests, as the Hefe report made clear. Now, here's a very long uh, excerpt from the Hefe report. On the night of August 11th, Wait, no, this is not the Heavey Report. I'm sorry. This is a long quote from the motion talking about the Heavey Report. 
On the night of August 11th, the Worrell family attended a training led by aggressive left-wing activist groups where they received instruction on how to, quote, delay and obstruct, end quote, defendants' free speech, even to the point of breaking the law. These activist groups believed defendants' free expression under the First Amendment constituted racist hate speech. Judge Worrell's attendance at this meeting suggests he and his family agree with the positions of those activist groups. His attendance alone, therefore, raises doubts about his impartiality because a judge cannot participate in activism opposing a defendant's political demonstration and then later adjudicate a criminal case based on that demonstration. Obviously. That's the end of that quote there. But Worrell isn't the only problem. His wife and daughter are hard-left, communist activists, who hate whites and their country. Their public statements even two years after the event, the motion argues, uh, suggest that they suffered psychological damage. Quote, his daughter evidently feared her large black father, that's a quotation, would be the victim of a racial hate crime. His wife found it, quote, surreal to be, quote, surrounded by Nazis. And of course, his wife's recent social media activity explicitly shows that at least one member of the Worrell family, quote, hates white people and all their, quote, white supremacy BS, end quote. The motion re- uh, reproduces Catherine Lawfin's, they don't have the same last name, the wife and his, uh, the judge and his wife, her social media posts, including the blatantly racist tweet, honestly, I kind of do hate white people she wrote. Unsurprisingly, her Twitter account no longer exists. But all of these things uh, they got screenshots of, they put it in the motion, and now they filed that motion, and now the judge's wife is deleting all of her tweets. Like, we don't have those things. <laughs> Incre- the arrogance of these people. Like, they're going to get away with this. Young Althea, that is the judge's daughter, who told a podcaster she feared for her, quote, large black father, is equally unhinged. This is a family program. I can't quote this language. But you can see in the article, you know what, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to link you this article in the YouTube here. There you go. So you can follow along. You can see the profanity yourself. Hopefully your kids can't read that. Um, Well, hopefully they can't. Hopefully your kids are very advanced and they can read. And uh, just don't show them this. Anyway, lots of profanity. Very classy. uh, Nice, (laughs) says the, the author of the article. Nice. There's much, much more from Catherine and Althea, but that's enough to get the gist of their deranged animus toward whites. The motion rightly asks whether Worrell considers himself an anti-fascist, and whether he, like his wife, also honestly hates white people. The canons of judicial conduct for the Commonwealth of Virginia not only requires judges with personal knowledge of disputed evidentiary facts to recuse themselves, the motion observes, but also requires recusal when the judge is a material witness in the matter. And that mandate applies if a family member is, to the judge's knowledge, likely to be a material witness in the matter. The motion warns that Worrell and his wife and or daughter will be called as witnesses. His wife will certainly be called. She is, in fact, subpoenaed for Wednesday. It's not in this article. But that's an ongoing fight. Here's another thing. When she was subpoenaed, it wasn't a private attorney that she hired that tried to quash the subpoena. No, 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 no. It was the Antifa prosecutor, Lawton Tufts, who allegedly worked as an Antifa organizer with the chief judge's daughter, who filed the motion to quash the subpoena for the chief judge's wife, his friend's mother. What do you even say about that? It is so blatantly corrupt. You would see something like this in Haiti, or Iraq, or Nigeria, and you just shake your head and be like, yeah, that's how things are there. They don't actually have a legal system. That is Albemarle County, Virginia, 
It is now a communist third world state. You, just, you could not imagine this happening in America when I was growing up, or even 10 years ago. It's unthinkable. And now I'm in the middle of it. Anyway, the motion also alleges that Worrell has not, as the canon requires, disclosed information relevant to a possible recusal. And even if Worrell thinks he can be impartial, quote, the overwhelming amount of demonstrable, publicly available evidence raising serious doubts about his impartiality give the impression to any observer that the integrity of this case has been thoroughly compromised, end quote. Not that it could be thoroughly compromised, hypothetically, in the future, if we call his wife as a witness. No, it's already, obviously, it is thoroughly compromised. The entire city, the entire circuit, the judicial circuit, is corrupted to its core, with the Antifa judge at its center, and the Antifa prosecutors working with him and his family to commit this outrage. This cannot be countenanced in America. Back to the article. Another important point from the motion, federal and state law governs recusal as well, and they demand recusal even for the appearance of bias. Actual bias need not be shown. All those facts also mean that Worrell's sitting on the case would compromise Dix's 14th Amendment due process rights, the motion argues. And this segues into Dix's next argument. None of the judges in the 16th district can judge the case fairly. Quote, any judge presiding over this case may be called upon to evaluate the credibility of Judge Worrell and or his immediate family members as witnesses in this matter. Thus, any judge from this district will be required to possibly make an unfavorable ruling against their superior judicial officer or his family members. The natural conflict of interest in that situation, or at least the perception of such a conflict of interest, cannot be mitigated absent recusal of all judges from this district. End quote. Of particular interest is Judge Cheryl Higgins, the judge who recently ruled against Invictus's motion to dismiss. Worrell has presided over hearings and cases over which Higgins also presided. In other words, they share cases. So, I think I might have explained this on Cantwell's show, but I don't know. Maybe I just explained it in private life, but in ancient times, judges would ride the circuit, right? They would literally go around in a circle through all these shires and counties and they would show up and they would hear cases. They'd go to the next place. They'd, they'd have everybody come to them with their petitions and they would hear cases and they would ride around in this circuit. And that's where we get this term, circuit court. Well, in places like Florida, here in Orange County, right? Um, judge has his own courtroom. Judge has his own cases. You get a criminal charge here, you are assigned to that judge. That particular judge has your case forever until that judge moves or quits or dies or whatever the case may be, or you file a motion to recuse the judge and you get kicked to another judge's courtroom. There's no sharing cases here. You get one judge, that judge is going to be on that case. They're going to be familiar with your case. I, personally, I think that's a great thing. You know who your judge is. You know, you know what the uh, what the procedures are. You you know that that person is familiar with the facts of your case. You don't have to talk to six different judges re-explaining all the facts, and they have no idea what's going on. I personally, I think the Florida system uh, is how it should be. But there are some states like South Carolina, like Virginia, that have this totally ancient system still in place and that's cool but that's how it is in charlottesville these judges go back and forth on the bench they don't have their own cases they share cases and in fact uh Worrell and higgins have both been on my case right and we had to ask uh for a postponement so that we could ask Worrell to recuse himself and Again, to his credit, he did recuse himself on the spot, but they both had my case. Presumably, they both had Dix's case. Presumably, they both had all the cases, and there is no wall in there that would prevent any of this conflict from Worrell bleeding over. Obviously, Judge Higgins is compromised. There's no question about that. 
she has to recuse herself. Uh, Worrell, here, back to the article, Worrell has presided over hearings in cases over which Higgins also presided. Although Higgins has presided over Dix's case and Worrell hasn't, the motion argues that, quote, well, so I was wrong about that. He was on my case, but not Dix's case. But in any event, the motion argues that, quote, it is possible, if not probable, that Judge Worrell has in some meaningful way reviewed, accessed, or managed defendant's case file as well. Yeah, but that's not the real crux of it. The crux of it is they share an office. They share the same staff. And that's what they're about to get into. Then comes this zinger. Quote, Notably, Judge Worrell and Judge Higgins often share chambers in this court, with pending case files equally accessible to both. They share the same court staff. As such, any concerns about Judge Worrell's impartiality are imputed to Judge Higgins as well due to their overlapping duties with respect to this matter. Neither judge has disclosed the existence of any sort of conflict wall between them to avoid potential conflicts. Given the above, the court must recuse all judges of the 16th Judicial Circuit from presiding over this case. Having any judge of the 16th Judicial Circuit preside over this case raises the same legal and ethical concerns. End quote. Higgins' ruling on Invictus's motion also offers a clear reason for recusal. Although two prosecutors said the torch-lit march did not run afoul of the state statute of, on burning an object, and the legislature didn't change that statute after the Unite the Right rally, she let the case proceed when, again, a third prosecutor charged the nine men with what amounts to what was called anti-Soviet agitation in Stalin's Russia. These charges are nakedly political. Higgins knows that. Even the most ardent opponent of the Unite the Right must wonder whether Higgins, who certainly knew Worrell attended the Antifa church meeting, could possibly have ruled fairly as Worrell peered over her shoulder. That, of course, is the point of Dix's motion to recuse. The judges can't adjudicate fairly, and so Worrell and his subordinates must recuse themselves. So, as I said on Cantwell's show, Higgins seems to be a sweet lady. I think it was clearly someone in her office who put the gag order on me. I don't think it was her. I think someone went rogue and said, no, Invictus shouldn't talk about this case at all. But that, again, is evidence that that staff, that is Worrell's staff and Higgins' staff at the same time, they have the same assistance. That is evidence that this just cannot be. Higgins cannot sit on this trial. She cannot sit on this case. And she seems like a nice lady. She seems like she is held hostage by these people in this town. I feel sorry for her, but she can't hear the case. She's got to go. And she must know that. Uh, everybody knows that. And even if it weren't the case that they were sharing the same staff, even if it weren't the case that she's, you know, surrounded by a mob of bloodthirsty Antifa, the fact is that her boss is looking over her shoulder and she's got to share that room with him every single day. That just, you cannot countenance that in America. That is obviously, put it, put the shoe on the other foot here. You know, what if Donald Trump were president right now and he is charging Joe Biden and Hunter Biden with crimes uh, for money laundering, right? And uh, the judge in charge of this case uh, was Trump's chief of staff. Right? He's now the chief judge. He used to be Trump's chief of staff. Now he's the chief judge. Just happens to be presiding over this case. And uh, he shares a staff with some, you know, Democrat judge. Uh, but they share the same staff and they're in the same room and they share cases all the time. Uh, you know, do you think that Democrat judge is going to be like, oh, I'm a free agent. I can do whatever, whatever I want. Like there's no pressure on that person at all come on man you could not argue that with a straight face in fact 
it's notable that Lawton Tufts never does argue with the straight face. He, every hearing we are in, he is smirking like a child. Like he knows how absurd this entire thing is. This entire thing is a show. And this homosexual Antifa thinks it's funny. It's hilarious that you would have a father of 10 drag him there from Texas and hold him there without bond and force him to take a plea. Oh, hilarious. Well, did you have a fellow lawyer here in Orlando who is also a father of nine, not of 10, I'll admit, don't have as many kids as the Texas guy, but you jail him for a month, have him extradited across state lines. Oh, hilarious. Hilarious. All of these legal cases in Orlando now in jeopardy because you think this is so funny. Not funny at all. And this is going to come back around. So, anyway, that's that article in Twitter. I'm, excuse me, Telegram. So here we are, it's 10.30. I have really got to get up early in the morning. Got to go to uh, Virginia for this exact thing. <laughs> On Wednesday, we've got the hearing. So let's see, what else do we have in Telegram? Um, actually, just one more article, which is about the Colorado trial, which we already discussed. So... Um, my Twitter, as I said, is fire, Emperor Invictus. But I will say my business coach is right. I've really got to get the Twitter back on mission. It's just, you know. Oh, yeah, of course. The last one I posted was Ezra Pound. <laughs> this guy, uh, like these 10, 10 lessons from Ezra Pound. Uh, Unabomber Manifesto. Oh, it's the same guy. So then you got all these uh, 13 best insights from a philosopher terrorist, Ted Kaczynski. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So my Twitter has nothing to do with my law firm, and this is bad marketing. And uh, so from now on, we'll be more on mission. So that is the episode for tonight. Let's go to the comments here, see if uh, you guys could even hear me the whole time. Oh, good. Looks like everybody could hear us. Kitty says, have a wonderful night, Mr. Invictus. Oh, back at you, Kitty. Uh, Clint says, I heard Chris did a great job testifying. I don't know about his testimony, but I'll tell you, at that uh, thing, you could actually, you should watch his episode of Radical Agenda. I think it's called Closing Argument. And he presents the argument he would have presented at that trial had he been allowed, even with the outrageous restrictions, I think he only got like 12 minutes to present his entire case. Uh, literally got like 12 minutes for his closing argument. Even with that, um, he absolutely tore them apart. But if you watch that episode about the closing argument, he gives you the videos, he gives you the timeline, he gives you everything and just decimates the entire case. Um, and it shows you how if you are held without bond or you are a prisoner on trial, um, you have no chance. The entire system is designed to destroy you. If you cannot get out on bond, you know, you better get right with Jesus because uh, you have been set up. Like, that is the whole, that is Prosecution 101. That's why you're in there, is so you cannot assist in your defense. And God forbid you're someone like Cantwell, who no one will represent, like, what are you going to do? So he talks about this whole story about how he's moved from here to there, and he's not allowed to have a hard drive here, and he finally gets a hard drive, and he goes to this other prison, and they're like, well, can't have a hard drive here, buddy, sorry. And he's like, well, all of my defense is on there. And they said, well, that's too bad, can't give it to you. I mean, the entire saga of how he was shipped from here to there awaiting this trial and finally shows up to trial and he's not allowed to have any of his paperwork or his evidence or anything. I mean, that's how this system works. All right, Clint, uh, Shovelhead says the Chris Cantwell Augustus show was fire. Oh, yeah. I, I have to agree with that. Oh, yes, um, Robert E. Lee. The statue was finally 
why did I, I didn't post this in my telegram. Um, they finally burned down the bloody statue. So this whole episode in Charlottesville, the Unite the Right rally, was in Lee Park, where the big statue of Robert E. Lee was there, him on horseback. And we had the rally there. It's permitted there. And then the city of Charlottesville moved it to a different park, to McIntyre Park. ACLU finally did their bloody job, filed a federal case about it, won, got it moved back to Lee Park. That pissed off everybody in Charlottesville. So much so that uh, ACLU didn't do anything right again for years until like last week when they filed a amicus brief on behalf of Trump, uh, objecting to the, dr- the, uh, <clears throat> the gag order in his federal case. So anyway, the whole thing centered around they're trying to tear down this statue of Robert E. Lee. You, you might remember that if you were alive, you know, back in 2017. And paying attention to what was going on, they were wrecking the entire country. It was, a, it was a, an, an open revolution. They were tearing down statues everywhere. Anything having to do with white people was being absolutely destroyed. So Robert E. Lee was on that list. The Unite the Right uh, rally was obviously Unite the Right. I mean, that was the whole point of it. But also uh, a protest against taking down the Lee statue. And that's why it was at that particular park. So finally, they took it down. And now it is a homeless encampment. You, know, you go there like like I have to go once a week. <laughs> I have to go to the courthouse and you drive by Lee Park. And it is now a literal homeless encampment. The entire thing, the entire park is tents filled with drug addict homeless people. What an improvement. Great things they've done in the city of Charlottesville. Uh, So then they took the whole thing and they burned it down and they're going to make it into some other quote unquote artwork, some hideous Black Lives Matter monstrosity. It's going to be. God knows what it's going to be, but I'm sure it's going to be amazing. The uh, Michelangelo's David of our time, I'm sure. Cozy Frog says, Beyond corrupt. In some states, they'll keep you on no bond for six months, then offer plea deal after rotting for five months. Of course, a father now behind on bills would take one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these guys, they were looking at, you know, as I am, five years in prison. You get offered six months, uh, and you are held without bond. You cannot assist in your own defense. You cannot hire a lawyer. You're in Charlottesville, which, as we've said, is a third world communist country. What are you going to do? I don't blame anyone for taking a plea. Not in that situation. Uh, famous goat sacrifice behavior. I, Jimmy, I don't know what I missed. I, I don't know which part we're talking about here. <laughs> what we've talked about earlier. Free speech and gun rights for real, says Clint. All right. God bless America. Jimmy says, I was raised and live in Appalachia. We are not a rich people. All right. God bless Texas, says Seamus. Uh, yeah, they're literally on, so Clint is saying the border agents are literally on video cutting the fences. Yeah, there's video of this on the internet. These border agents going around cutting the razor wire fences in Texas and waving the immigrants in. Imagine being those guys. Those border patrol agents. How do they sleep at night? Or do they like survey everybody in the border patrol and say, hey, let's find all the like raging leftists that we have and we'll make them go cut the razor wire because they're going to feel good about it. Like, could you imagine one of these, you know, Second Amendment don't tread on me boomers being sent out there to cut this razor wire? Like, can you imagine the internal conflict they must go through? But these guys on these videos are smiling, waving people in. Your friendly neighborhood border patrol who's just patrolling to make sure you're safe while you're illegally entering the country. Uh, 
Judeo Christian. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, can't say a lot of these things. You know, you might not notice, fellow uh, audience members here, you might notice we are still on YouTube. 2017 was what, six, six years? Yeah, that's what we're talking about this whole. Th- so after Charlottesville, I don't know, some of you people, you weren't around at that time. So you don't know the aftermath of Charlottesville, but everybody even accused of going to that rally. They were banned from Airbnb. They were banned from Uber. They were banned from uh, Cash App, from uh, you know Chase Manhattan Bank. They, their bank accounts were cut off. They were not allowed. I mean, you name it. We were all banned from it. Uh, and then they did the same thing when, uh, you know, they started banning Russian oligarchs and people were all like, oh, how could they do this? Like, they did this exact same thing to everybody accused of being in Charlottesville for the Unite the Right rally. Um, wait. Where was I in the comments here? Well, whatever. Let's keep moving. <laughs> Oh, that's what I was going to say. I can't read some of these comments because you might notice we are still on YouTube. I'm obviously shadow banned on YouTube, but my account is here. Like, I have not been completely nuked from YouTube. So, you know, still towing that party line, I guess. No profanity. Modern Warfare 2 is the abbreviation. Well, what's the second half of that? (laughs) All right, so from now on, guy whose name is not Profanity, I'll I'll try to remember it's Modern Warfare. That's what I'm going to call you. Uh, Long live Palestine. Good luck with your trial. Thank you. Those those charges are frivolous, and you have a great case. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, Modern Warfare. We're all here. It is a full house this evening. It is a full house, Jimmy. Um... So the Cantwell episode, yes, please go watch that. It was very good. Good night, everybody. There's all saying hello. Oh, Florida Treasure. Long time no see. Um, man, Jimmy says, brings legitimate tears to my eyes. My family fought for the South. Makes me absolutely sick. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, man, I was uh, very much Southern identity, all that, proud to be a Southerner. Uh, until I went to jail in South Carolina. And uh, just the hell I went through there. I loved South Carolina. Absolutely loved it. Both my, well, I mean, I have a lot of kids, but these two particular sons, while I was there, you know, they they were born in South Carolina. We loved living there. And then, you know, just absolute disgusting behavior by these people took it right took all the southern pride right out of me and my lawyer was from new jersey of all places what a curse word new jersey is (laughs) and uh, my lawyer greatest lawyer in south carolina was from new jersey and all these southern Lawyers descended from great southern families, antebellum families, just crapped the bed in the most disgusting miscarriage of justice I've seen in my life. That's what did it for me, Jimmy. Not burning the Robert E. Lee statue, but seeing what has happened to the South. And remember, Charlottesville is the South. At least it used to be. Anyway, everybody, I'm really late. Got to go to Mass in the morning. Got to go to Virginia in the morning. Got to get out of here. So, it's been real. Wish me luck. And we'll see you when we come back. Good night, everybody.